My name is uh, Dr. Wendy Weber, and I'm the Branch Chief for Clinical Research at the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. Um, we use a lot of protocols for many of our trials and ask our investigators to submit those, and so that's why I was asked to, to give this lecture. Um, I do want to give credit to um, Dr. Laura Lee Johnson, who I know is one of the faculty for many of your courses. Um, she used to give this lecture many years ago and uh, uh, transferred it over to me when I joined NCCIH, and um, I, I still uh, heavily rely on her initial slides, so I'd like to give her credit for that. So... What I'm going to talk about tonight are the, to define the different parts of a protocol and hopefully give you a really strong rationale as to why you want a very well-written protocol for any clinical study that you uh, attempt to undertake. And then also to give you, there's a, at the very end, a number of different resources to help you in the design of these different uh, protocols. Uh, within the NIH intramural program, there are, are certain templates that are available, and I'm going to share with you a recent template for a protocol document that um, was just recently released for public comment from the FDA and NIH for uh, trials that involve uh, products that will be um, used in trials that are conducted under an IND or an IDE, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we get there. So the question that, um, especially people who are new to clinical trials, there's often a lot of confusion around the difference between what goes in the application versus what's in an actual protocol versus how detailed the manual of operations and procedures is. And so there's, for, um, particularly for first time uh, people doing trials, they're like, it's all in the application, that's exactly what I'm gonna do. Well, in reality, most applications have page limits, and so you only have a few pages to really succinctly describe what it is you're planning to do in that application and in, in that project. Whereas a protocol doesn't have a page limit, and it really should be a very detailed discussion of exactly how everything is going to be done. In the case of a, of a protocol, someone else should be able to pick it up and run the same study and get the same results, ideally. It, should, it, it adds to our ability to replicate trials if we have very well-documented and well-written protocols. Now, the difference between a protocol and a manual of operations and procedures is that uh, what we sometimes call the MOP is that the MOP has even more detail. And so, for example, if you will be uh, collecting blood samples in your trial, you may just describe what types of tubes are used to collect those blood and that they'll be processed and shipped and where they'll be shipped to. Whereas in your manual of operations and procedures, you'll detail specifically how much blood, how many of each tube, and not only that, but how each one is processed, if it needs to be spun in a centrifuge, how long it should be spun in a centrifuge, if it needs to be stored at specific temperatures, all of those details will be there, as well as the detailed process of how you ship uh, any specimens that need to be shipped in, in the, um, for the study protocol. So it's the level of detail as to the difference between these different documents. And so the question I often get is, once people get past the, the idea that their application is not sufficient to describe what they're going to do for their study, um, and they get to the idea of a protocol and, and get comfortable with that, they start realizing that there are these two different documents, and the question is, do I really need both? And the answer really depends on, the, um, on how large your study is, how many detailed procedures there are going to be. Um, for many institutions, there are standard operating procedures, for example, of how patients with uh, suicidality, uh, when they are depressed, are, are managed. And there's a standard operating procedure of how that is done at a, at a given institution. And rather than redetail all of that out in the protocol, you can refer to the standard operating procedure and just file that in your MOP um, is what you can do. And so depending on how many of those you have, it may make more sense to separate the documents, have a protocol that's kind of the streamlined, this is what we do, and the MOP is absolutely every single detail to make sure that it's done uh, step by step the way that it needs to be done. Another time when it can be very useful to have both documents is when you're conducting a multi-site study and one or more of your institutions requires that they use their template for a protocol. A manual of operations uh, and procedures can really help to make sure that all of the sites are doing procedures the same way. 
So whether it's the manual of the intervention delivery for like cognitive behavioral therapy and step-by-step -step what is gonna be done in the trial and how the intervention is gonna be delivered, um, those kinds of details don't always need to be in the protocol. They can be more detailed in the MOP and then uh, each institution can refer to a shared manual of operations and procedures for the aspects that will be done the same across the different sites. So this again helps to ensure that uh, there's fidelity of the intervention, that it's done the same way across all sites. Another um, scenario where that's really helpful is if you're, um, if each site is, for example, running a cytokine panel on, on uh, blood samples, and you wanna make sure that everybody does it the same way, a very clear and detailed step-by-step -step process of, the, of uh, an actual uh, standard operating procedures of how that's going to be done and how that's shared across sites and how you're going to um, make sure that you have sim uh, similar standards across sites. It can be done through the MOP as well. Um, the key piece about having both is that whenever you update one document, you have to be sure to update the other document. There is a lot of overlap between these two. And so you want to make sure that whenever you're making protocol changes, you're updating your manual of operating procedures along with it so that you don't run into discrepancies where um, if you don't follow your protocol, you essentially deviate from your protocol and you have to file it as a protocol deviation. Well, if you start off with the two documents telling you to do different things, you have set yourself up to no matter what, have a deviation from either your MOP or from your protocol one way or the other. So. Um, making sure that things agree is really important. So the purpose of a protocol is to really give you an overall roadmap of how the study is going to be laid out and how it's going to be done. From the study design all the way through recruitment and uh, randomization of participants if they're randomized, delivery of the intervention if you're delivering an intervention, how you're going to collect data from individuals, how you're going to then store that data, use that data, analyze that data, and report it in the end. So it really is from beginning to end of your cl clinical study. And it really takes you to the next step of, okay, this is the five or six pages or maybe 12 pages I had to describe what I was gonna do and detail it all out as to exactly how I'm going to do this. You can often um, anticipate problems. So if you realize that you need to do a fasting blood draw first thing, but you also need to get some other baseline measure on an individual and you have to decide which one needs to be done first. Do we want to give them, you know, take our, our blood draw first or do we want to have them perform this really important um, lab measure that also needs to be done fasting? When can we feed them? Well, can we feed them in our clinical site? as to <clears throat> where they're actually being seen and where the data is being collected? Or do we have to take them to some other waiting area so they can have a snack before we ask them to fill out three hours of survey instruments? You can't come ask someone to come in fasting and then give them three hours of additional survey instruments to fill out without giving them an opportunity to eat. So writing all of these different steps out really helps you in figuring out and identifying where the challenges are gonna be. And it's really helpful to have one of your staff members or even I often hear the principal investigator will say, okay, I'm patient zero. Walk me through this. Let's act as if, okay, what questionnaire do I fill out next? What piece do I do next? Where do I need to go? Well, what if the lab that needs to do your EKGs is 30 minutes across town and you were thinking you were going to do that as part of your first study visit when you have a whole bunch of other things you need to do at another site? Spelling this all out can really help you uh, figure out the flow of the study and make sure that, that things happen in a way that can actually be done. And while you write that all in the protocol, not until, or sorry, you write that all in the application, it's not until you actually sit down and think about actually taking a patient through it all do you realize they need to be in two different places at once or who is going to, you know, this person's supposed to be blinded and this task is going to unblind them, and so how are we going to collect that information and, and make sure that we're not um, uh, unintentionally uh, unblinding our study staff and reducing the rigor of our studies? Um, so the other, there's many purposes to the protocol. Another is to really make sure that everything is done the same way for all participants, and that's both the safeguard of the participants in the actual study 
as well as to make sure that the data is collected the same way in all participants. Um, I often give the example of blood pressure. If we have a participant who's running late, they walk in and the first thing you do is, is measure their blood pressure and they've been stuck in traffic for an hour and a half and they saw an accident on their way in and now you want to take their blood pressure and if that's your primary outcome, whether or not blood pressure is redu reduced, that's probably not the best um, accurate and most accurate measure of what their resting blood pressure is. So how long do you need to have them wait? How long do they need to rest? Can they talk on their cell phone while they're resting? Will that increase their blood pressure even more? So there's a lot of different details, even though it's something as simple as blood pressure, if it's your primary outcome, you do need to specify the details of how you're gonna collect that. Are they sitting? Are they standing? Are they laying down? There's a lot of different ways that you can collect something like as simple as blood pressure. So the other nice thing about having this protocol all written out is it really facilitates communication among all of the different players that are involved in a clinical trial. So you have your biostatistician involved, you have your funding agency potentially involved, your collaborators, the employees that you might be working with. If you're working with a funding agency that is an employer, for example, that's another group that you might be working with. And by laying this all out and kind of identifying your analytic plan and what the primary secondary outcomes are gonna be, you actually can get quite a head start on your manuscript preparation because you've already detailed all of your methods in your protocol and then you can just you can even do a methods paper about the protocol itself so you don't have to reference that and use so much of your um, space in your primary publication talking about the study design itself you can reference that in a separate separate publication and you can even start making decisions about authorship and who what are the qualifications for authorship those kinds of things we often see in protocols as well so I mentioned that there was something new. Um, this is the something new. So just um, about last week or so, uh, March 17th, uh, the NIH and the FDA um, put a notice out in the guide asking for public comment on a draft clinical trial protocol template that would be used for phase two and phase three uh, IND or IDE studies. So uh, um, either Substances that fall under the investigational new drug application and need to be conducted under an IND uh, uh, with the FDA's oversight or device studies that are required to have the study conducted under an IDE, um, which is the investigational device exemption application. And so um, this is open for public comment for a month. Um, all of the screenshots I'm going to use for the table of contents for the protocol actually comes from this template. And if you use the link that's here about how to submit a response and um, from, uh, to get to the draft template, you'll see that these are available on the Office of Science Policy here at NIH um, for these clinical trial uh, protocol template documents. Also, there are the policies related to the clinical trial definition for NIH, the sharing clinical trial information uh, policies, and clinical trial enrollment uh, tracking requirements for NIH. So this is, um, as I said, something brand new, but it is something that I think you're gonna see um, um, being used across NIH as, as a protocol template and for the FDA as well for these IND, IDE type studies of phase two and phase three designs. So what I plan to do next is to walk through some of the key elements of a protocol. Um, I, as you'll see as I show you the screenshots of the table of contents, you'll see that the list is quite long <laughs> of all of the elements that go in. One of the things you'll notice if you go to the site is that there's two documents there. One is a PDF that is um, the template with instructions in it, and the other is a fillable Word document that um, that doesn't have the instructions so that you can really use it as a template and create your own protocols. But there are instructions in the PDF version. As I mentioned, I'm only gonna highlight a few of the really key areas. And what I'm gonna try to do as well is kind of point out where the protocol would vary from a MOP. Um, there's so much overlap in what's covered. I'm gonna try to give you a few examples in each section around how a MOP might be different and what additional information you might find in the Manual of Operations and Procedures.